Hi there and welcome new or regular listeners. Thank you for tuning in. This is Red Ice Creations Radio and I am your host Henrik Palmgren. This is Internet Talk Radio based out of Sweden, Scandinavia. Uh, the website is redicecreations.com. Frequently updated news, links, resources and of course our radio archive. And Red Ice Creations members have full access to our entire archive where we also have extended interviews with many of our guests an uh, excellent resource for those who want to dive deeper into the many subjects that we highlight on this program. Today we are going to dive into the topics of Gnosticism, sacred ecology, the archons, religion, belief and uh, much more. We have John Lash with us on the line and uh, we're going to talk about his book Not in His Image, Gnostic Visions, Sacred Ecology and the Future of Belief. Uh, John's website that you need to take a look at is metahistory.org. That's an excellent and vast resource with uh, tons of articles for you to explore further into these topics. So uh, it's a pleasure to have John Lash with us here today. Hi, John. Welcome to Red Eyes Creations Radio. Yes, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. It's excellent to have you here. I've been looking forward to this program for a long time, so it's great to, to have you on here. Um, you know, I would like to begin to, to, I guess, talk a little bit about um, Gnosticism and your interest in the subject. Uh, uh, I guess the, the best place to start is to just, um, you know, ask what got you started in the first place uh, into the subject. Well, I'll give you the, uh, the clue. You know how life is. It, it gives us these clues which uh, are not... Uh, so clear at the beginning, but then if we follow those clues in the course of life, they sometimes lead us into deep, into deep areas. When I was about, I think, 16 or 17, I was working uh, at a, for a summer job somewhere in, in, uh, in the United States and around New York, uh, working as a waiter in a summer resort, and uh, always looking for things to read. And I happened to come across these books, which belonged to the Alexandria Quartet by Lawrence Durrell. And these were books that were quite popular in the, in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. Lawrence Durrell was a British novelist. And it turns out that Durrell, D-U-R-R-E-L-L, who was a, a close friend of Henry Miller, mm-hmm. uh, was interested in some esoteric matters, such as the Kabbalah and Gnosticism. Well, I was just a country kid. I, I grew up in a small town in, in Friendship, Maine, a little fishing village, very much uh, of the kind of fishing villages that you have, you know, in Sweden and Norway. Sure. That part of the world, a little village of, of eight or 900 people. I had no uh, exposure to es- esoterics or Gnosticism in that world. But by coming across these novels of Lawrence Durrell, uh, called the Alexandria Quartet, he spoke about Gnosticism and the Gnostics, and it, it intrigued me terribly, although I know nothing about it. Sure. And so then over the years, I, had, uh, uh, I explored it more, and I eventually, uh, by the time I was in my mid-20s, was, was deeply into uh, the texts and the mythology. Hmm. Interesting. So um, how long have you been been writing yourself on the subject. I don't know what, which, uh, not in his image, your, your, I guess that's your latest book, uh, which, is that your first one or third no, one? No, it's or? my last, it's my most recent book. It came out November of 2006. Mm-hmm. And behind not in his image, there was about 10 years, 1996 to 2006, hmm. of intense research on the Gnostic texts. Here in uh, Belgium, uh, near to Brussels, where I live sometimes, uh, there is a university called the Catholic University of Leuven, or mm-hmm. Louvain. Sure. Yeah, it's one of the oldest uh, universities in Europe. It's a humanistic, it was a humanistic center. It's connected with Erasmus, the famous uh, philosopher. And it so happens that at the University of Louvain, although it's very Catholic, there is a whole team of Gnostic scholars, experts on Gnosticism, mm and the Coptic language, and also, it, it so happens, experts on the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ah. So I spent a good deal of time uh, doing my research there. I wrote about five drafts of Not in His Image before the one that uh, is printed now. So I had ten years of intense study, and then before that, I, I really have been involved with Gnosticism uh, since my mid-twenties, so 
it's really been a lifetime effort. I understand. Yeah, definitely fascinating. You know, I would like to talk, get into and talk a little more about, about the book here. Uh, and I guess we could begin with the title itself, uh, Not in His Image. Now, you know, is that intended to scare the Christians away or to make them pick up the book? Well, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, they may choose to uh, run away from it, or they may choose to pick up the book and to uh, consider why someone would say that we are not made in God's image, which is what I'm saying. Mm. I'm saying that the story we're told, which comes from the Bible, Christian Bible, and the belief that we are uh, in the Western Christian world, the belief that is given to us, that humanity is somehow made in the image of the Creator, which is a male deity, Jehovah, is not so. It is not true. And what I do in my book is I expose that belief as a false belief. And I use Gnosticism because the Gnostic texts contain many points which uh, argue against patriarchy, against Christian religion, and precisely against that concept that we are made in the image of a Father God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when we when we talk about uh, the Gnostic text, is this the bulk of this? Is this that was found uh, in in Qumran, um, the, the Nag Hammadi library, or is there any other sources? <clears throat> excuse me, from outside there. Well, the sources <laughs> are of two kinds, Henrik. There are the Coptic texts written in the Coptic language, that mm -hmm. were found not at Qumran, that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Okay. The Coptic texts were found at Nag Hammadi in Egypt in the first week of December 1945, mm. which happens to be exactly when I was born. And <laughs> they are the practically the only surviving originals that we have. I don't really think they even are originals, but they are close to originals. So we rely very strongly on those, and there are about 53 documents in there, but only about 30 of them are of any value. The others are very fragmentary and so forth. Additional to that, there are, the, there are three other Coptic documents that were discovered before Nag Hammadi, mm -hmm. uh, such as the Bruce Codex, the Askew Codex, and so forth. And then there are a number of Greek language works which contain Gnostic teachings, but all in all, I have to tell you, it's a pretty pitiful handful of material. Hmm. The reason why, and I, I, I want to emphasize this to all the listeners, the reason why we have so little of the original Gnostic material is not by accident, and it is not because of the damage of time and having these, these manuscripts and texts and scrolls being just riding away, mm. it is because they were systematically destroyed over a camp in a campaign that lasted hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So there's very little that remains. But the Nag Hammadi documents that were discovered in Egypt are really the principal focus right now of, of Gnostic studies. Understand. Um, so have they all been fully translated? And if so, who has done the translation on these things? Shortly after the Nag Hammadi uh, documents were found in 1945, their importance was recognized. And uh, sometime later, as I explain in my book, uh, a team of scholars from a theological college in California, Claremont College, undertook to do the translations. And this team was led by a man named James Robertson. And so what they produced, I think it was around 1976, was the so-called Nag Hammadi Library in English. Mm -hmm. And this is the principal book that, that your readers would go out or anyone would go out and buy in a bookstore to read the Coptic literature. There have also been other, of other translations by other scholars, mm -hmm. but that's the primary translation. There's only one in English. There's only one in French. Uh, I don't know if it's been translated into into Swedish. I'm sure it has been into, into German and other languages. Mm. I must warn, however, that these translations are, are atrocious. Really? They're very bad. Uh, some, to some extent, if you look, if you go into a bookstore, I would advise you to look through 
the Nag Hammadi Library in English before you buy it. <laughs> okay. Because a great deal of it is incomprehensible. It's, it's gibberish. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't really hang together uh, at all. Uh, so that is a difficult thing for those people who want to approach uh, Gnosticism. I, I must warn you that it, it's not an easy subject. And how did you kind of, uh, you know, manage to to differ between the the versions, and, and what one do you consider to be a good one for people to go into? I don't, I don't consider any of them to be really good. I mean, there are there's another translation by a scholar called uh, uh, Leighton, which is not particularly good either. I'll tell you what the problem is, mm-hmm. Henrik. Uh, yeah. There are two problems basically. One is that these Coptic texts that we're relying on to know about Gnosticism were written in Coptic, which is not really a a true language. It's a language that was invented around 100 uh, B.C. Mm -hmm. in order to translate hieroglyphics into a kind of, into another, into a kind of shorthand. In other words, at that time in Egypt, the whole civilization and religious culture of Egypt had declined, and there were fewer and fewer priests who could read hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it became necessary to convert hieroglyphics into another language, and Coptic was invented for that purpose. It's not a genuine language. It's it's very uh, awkward. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It does not express profound philosophical ideas. The constructions are very uh, complicated. And even the scholars who are translating these Coptic texts point out that they're full of grammatical errors, they are difficult to understand, uh, the, the grammar is, is, uh, uh, is complex and confusing. So that's the first part of the problem. We have these Gnostic texts written in a language that is not ideal hmm. for transmitting profound or mystical ideas. Sure. Okay? Yeah. The second problem is one that I address in the preface of my book, not in his image. I point out in there that the prominent Gnostic scholars today, such as this woman Elaine Pagels, your listeners may have heard of her because she wrote the Gnostic Gospels, Mm -hmm. are religious scholars. They have positions in universities. They're deeply respected. They've studied the Coptic language. They've probably been to Egypt and all that. But there is one thing that they are not. They are not practicing mystics. Mm. So I would ask you, how can someone who is not a practicing mystic translate mystical literature? Well, obviously it's going to be very difficult to understand and uh, and do the translation uh, correctly, you know. It is. They're just going to be guessing. Sure. You know, you would expect if someone writes a book about golf, you would expect that they play golf. Sure. And that they know the they know the game. If someone writes a book about Antarctica, the least that you expect is that they went to Antarctica, or at and least, they, mm-hmm. they spent some time there. But when you read the books, and there are many, many of them now, mm. as you know, because Gnosticism has become widely discussed, sure. to some extent because of the Da Vinci Code, you know. Yeah. Uh, when you read these books by these experts, I have to tell you, they, are, they may be expert scholars, but they are handling mystical and esoteric material, and they have no experience of that field. Hmm. And so it's very, very difficult for them to translate correctly what they're seeing. Uh, Can you read uh, the the language yourself? Have you done your own translation? How how did you been able to kind of uh, root out the information from these texts? Well, I studied the Nag Hammadi Library and all the related literature that is, as I said, that's not in Coptic for about 25 years before I started to tackle the Coptic. And fortunately, no, I am not proficient in Coptic. I am not a Coptic scholar. I cannot read Coptic fluently. However, 